How's it going, guys? Quiet, it took quiet this morning. I attribute it to being Wednesday, and you're going to say, no, Dr. Barnes, it's Friday, but hear me out, okay? Hear me out. Remember, I've talked about how much I dislike Wednesdays and how they're just kind of the low point of the week. If you think about it, where we're at right now is the Wednesday of the semester, okay? We're right in the middle of the semester. We're we're not, we don't have the excitement and enthusiasm at the beginning of the semester where it's like us all fresh and excited about what we're going to learn. We're not at the end of the semester where we're just like, okay, it's almost over. Thank goodness you get to celebrate. We're at the Wednesday of the semester, okay? So even though today technically is a Friday, it's also Wednesday, okay? So I'm sorry I just ruined your Friday. I'm sorry I just ruined your Friday, but you got to call it like it is. But yeah, enthusiasm and energy levels are low. You know, the most interesting thing I found out uh, is that this is the time that the administrators of the university like to have all their meetings. It's like I had a bunch of meetings this week and I was just like, okay. And, and if you know anything about me, I just like meetings. You'll probably hear if you take Dr. Caden's course, she'll just talk about how Dr. Barnes always complains about meetings. That's a true statement. I whine like, a, I whine like crazy about meetings. But uh, yeah, uh, I, I, I'm with you. You know, my energy level's down. I had trouble getting up this morning. I was telling my graduate students, Back when I was working in public accounting, um, I uh, had uh, kind of a routine that I worked through because I'm not a morning person by any stretch of the imagination. And the later I can sleep, like nine o'clock is like my 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 sweet spot of waking up in the morning. That's where I'd like to wake up if I could, but that's just not practical. Back when I was in public accounting, I'd want to get up in the morning and work out. So 5 a.m., I would down like a five-hour energy because, and I'd go back to bed, all right? The idea being is that the caffeine would hit my system and I don't want to wake up and actually get to do stuff. It was still a challenge, but uh, that's kind of how I did it. I don't know what that did to me, because if you, if you do any research about those five-hour energies, first of all, they're awful tasting, okay? It's not something you would take for for, for flavor. And secondly, it's like basically injecting caffeine straight into your veins. That's kind of the example, and uh, all these chemicals. And I wouldn't recommend that approach, but that was how that's how I got my uh, got away and got to be a morning person back in the day. Now I just kind of go to the traditional drink a cup of coffee when I wake up and hopefully that I'll wake up and be somewhat somewhat intelligible. It's getting harder as I get older. My intelligibility, if that's even a word, uh, is, is meandering. It's, it's getting more difficult. But yeah, I apologize. I just wasted three hours or three minutes of your day just talking about my, my personal chagrins, talking about Wednesdays on Friday and uh, caffeine. And uh, I guess that's not what you're paying me for. You're paying to learn about uh, AIS. So I'm going to teach about AIS today. We're going to do an Excel assignment. I forgot to put up my little Excel banner saying download stuff. So uh, as I'm talking right now, if you've not already, we've got two data sets for today. Uh, data set uh, six, six or Excel data set six, uh, part one and part two. And just for context, this is actually information that comes directly from the book. There's a reason I've got the book open. We're going to use this again when we go to homework and we'll do this a little bit. But in uh, the end of the uh, chapter 10, they actually have uh, Excel exercises for each of the types of analysis that we've, we talked about on, uh, I guess it was a Monday when we talked about this. Yeah, we talked about the different types of data analysis analytics. So just as a refresher, we talked about four types of data analytics, and they, they move up in intensity. So we talked about descriptive analytics, diagnostic analytics, predictive, and prescriptive. And so uh, descriptive analytics are they're very basic analytics, very, very basic and straightforward. They just ask the question, what happened? So we're going to look at information and see detail and try to uh, determine what's going on. Does that have value? Yes. Probably the less, least value of any of these. That's not to say that's not worthwhile. We're going to use it from a template that you should be somewhat familiar with already. And if not, you know, you'll learn something new today. Diagnostic is more about the question about why did it happen. And the example that I talked about is back in 221 when you did variance analysis. The goal was not to come up with those formulas and come up with those numbers and just say, look, I found an unfavorable variance or a favorable variance. The answer is, the question was, if it's unfavorable, answering the question of why was it an unfavorable variance, or if it's favorable, what happened to create a cause a, a favorable variance, answering the question of why something happened. <clears throat> We're going to kind of do that today. Um, I don't think this is a perfect activity to describe why, why but we're going to discuss what, we would, what our next steps would be based on the analysis. Then uh, we have predictive analysis, and predictive analysis saying uh, what will happen. So using past information to predict what's going to happen in the future. And then finally, we have the most powerful analysis, but the almost complex to complete is going to be our prescriptive analysis. It's based on what happened, or what we think will happen, excuse me, what we think will happen, what should we do? And so we're going to start out with the easy ones today. We're going to talk about the first two, and then next week, on uh, next Friday, we're going to visit the last two, and we're going to have Excel activities for all of these. 
And so these are going to help us answer different various questions. So if you want to follow along in the book, this is actually on page, I don't know what page on, uh, page, I think it starts page 263 in the book. And uh, I'll just be walking through the steps that are listed in the book. It's very routine and very straightforward. And the process here is not so much to follow the procedure step by step, but to understand why is it we're doing what we're doing and how it helps us to answer these particular questions. So this is going to be a little bit of a de deviation from Excel. Instead of learning formulas and trying to understand certain types of activities, we're going to implement this and integrate this into what we've been learning so far. And so let's go ahead and get on with it. Let's uh, start with uh, part one. So we're going to be doing some accounts receivable aging. Has anybody taken 302 with Dr. Eisen? You know, the accounts receivable aging. So where you have to say, all right, uh, we've got days outstanding of 0 to 30 and then 31 to 60 and 61 to 90. Uh, it's very it's very funny that this is one of the activities in this book because the author, Vern Richardson, is one of the most vocal advocates in accounting education out there for a new way of determining uh, accounts receivable aging or or determining bad debt, because this is actually what accountants traditionally use. And if you think about it, it is so easy. It is so basic. It's so straightforward. And we got these powerful computerized tools. We've got artificial intelligence that can change the scope and the face of the planet. Instead, we're just basically categorizing things according to how many days it's outstanding. It's kind of silly, but it is what we have, all right? Now, I hope somebody in this room is taking inspiration for what I'm talking about. Says, so, you know what? That is really basic, Dr. Barnes. I'm going to develop a new method for determining uh, an allowance for doubtful accounts that's going to revolutionize our industry. And if you do, I want this, you, when, you're, when you're getting your Nobel Prize speech, okay, do you know Nobel Prize speech, I want you to refer back to this moment. It says, I remember sitting in AIS class and Dr. Barnes was talking about how ridiculous what we were doing is, and I know that I've changed the face of the world and it's all thanks to him. So Dr. Barnes, to you, and, and hopefully you'll invite me to the Nobel Prize ceremony. I don't know if you get a Nobel Prize for anything in accounting, but you know, there's, there's my dream right there. Okay. And it's kind of unfortunate that I'm putting this burden on you instead of taking it on myself. But uh, my, my day has passed. It's yours. You guys have got the future. So we're going to do an account receivable aging. It's pretty straightforward, pretty basic uh, uh, as far as we go. Uh, it's, uh, and we're going to do a couple things. We're going to age the receivables and then uh, look at the receivables in the 61 and 90 bucket. So let's go ahead and look at what we're going to be doing. So first thing we're going to do is ask the question, how long the accounts, existing accounts receivable has been outstanding? So remember, that's the AMPS model, AMPS, for asking a question what it is that we want to answer. And we want to be able to uh, uh, be able to kind of just delineate these into different areas. So the very first thing we need to do is look at our Excel file. So mastering the data, that's looking at the data and preparing it for our analysis. And to do, to do that, we're going to use something called a data dictionary, which we've alluded to. But a data dictionary basically says it defines what our attributes are and what the information tells us. So customer, obviously name the customer, invoice amount, the name out, the invoice that remains unpaid. Uh, the receivable that's owed to the company, basically. And the due date is the day the invoice is due. All right, so now we get to the fun part. We're actually skipping the cleaning step. Now, keep in mind, as we're going to talk about in our homework, uh, the M, M step, uh, mastering the data, usually takes a lot more than what we're going to be doing. We're skipping the cleaning step. We're assuming that all this has already been done. We're going to do the analysis, which is the fun part. So let's go ahead, and we're going to uh, start out with our table. And so let's just go ahead and look at that. You kind of see here. Now, let's go ahead and type in the column up here. It's going to say days past due. Just type in days past due. And you're going to notice something really interesting, that it's defaulting to a, a, a white font and a white background, which is really not helpful, OK? So let's just go ahead and use our, uh, a, our format painter. So it's this little paintbrush over here. Click on C1, then click on the format painter, and then copy that over to D1. And just kind of set that up so it's actually the same format. So again, C1, click on Format Painter, and click on D1. Which is really a nice step to make things easy. All right. So days past due, we've got date fields, but we want to know the number of days. And believe it or not, it's not actually that hard. Because as I mentioned already in this course before, is that dates are just numeric transformations of data. So Excel does not recognize these as actual dates. They recognize them as number of days since a specific dates. Specifically, uh, January 1st, 1900. So we don't need to actually transition the dates because Excel already recognized the date. So we can just use mathematical models to do the calculation. So pretty easy, basic, straightforward. Let's go ahead and D2 it goes equals G1 minus C2. So we're subtracting December 31st, okay, from our due date of 12-2-21. Uh, uh, so this is when it was due. This is the date that it currently is. Today's date is December 31st. And we're just going to calculate how many days past due it is. 
that first one should say 29. Now, obviously, we'd like to flash fill this down. Okay, this makes things easy. We do have to do something before we flash fill. What is it we need to do? Yeah, we need to make an absolute cell references on G1. So on G1, go into your formula bar, click somewhere in G1 and hit F4. That's the shortcut for adding absolute cell references. Or you can just type in dollar signs if that's your jam. No judgment. Okay. But regardless, we want to have absolute cell references for G1 and floating cell references for C2. Once you do that, you can just flash fill it. And there you have it. We have number of days past due. Which by itself doesn't tell us anything, but we're not done. Okay, we're not done. Because what we're going to do is we're going to set this up in one of Dr. Caden's favorites. We're going to set this up into a pivot table. And we're going to be going to do a couple of pivot tables today. And uh, this, we call this Dr. Caden Appreciation Day in AIS. All right. So uh, we're going to do a couple of pivot tables. So let's go ahead and let's just select the entire table. By the way, if you're curious how I just did that, I just used the keyboard to do that. So click on A1. Hold down Control and Shift, press your right arrow key, and press your down arrow key. And I actually had to think about how I was doing that, because I do that. I've done that so naturally now I don't even think about it anymore. But Control Shift will say, pick this cell and every other cell that's in between. And then that will actually fly, uh, fly to the far end and to the bottom end will be pressed down and or right and down. All right. Now let's go ahead and use a shortcut. I want you to type Control T opens our table table tool. So we're going to say we've already selected our table. <laughs> table has headers. It should be checked. So once you've got that all listed up, click OK. That's going to open our table design. And as I said before, we're going to just do a pivot table. We could do this by just going to the insert pivot table, but I thought I'd do something different for today, mostly because that's what's in the instructions. OK. So we've got our table so highlighted. Let's just go summarize the pivot table. And we're not going to do any fancy things. We're just going to say table one, we're going to put it to a new worksheet. And then we got our pivot table, but we have to actually set some things up. All right. Now we're not going to have any columns here, but let's go ahead and rows, drag down days past due. And for value, let's create invoice amount. And I do want to make a change because we are not, we're, uh, the value of the, or the sum of the invoice amount actually would be relevant. But for our purposes, what we're going to be doing here, let's just go ahead and change this to account. So I want you to click on that arrow next to sum of field invoice amount. I want you to change, change, click on value field settings. And we're going to change that to count. Now, that's not to say that we wouldn't want to know both. We probably could actually put a count and a sum field here, but let's just go ahead and keep it a count for right now so we can know exactly how what the count is for each of these days. All right, so we've got a pivot table and we're close to where we want to be because it actually tells us how many items are uh, out are, are past due according to the number of days. We have from 9, 163 days. But this is not an accounts receivable aging. Remember, accounts receivable aging puts them into buckets. So we want to put them into buckets too. So let's go ahead and do that. What I'd like for you to do is go over to where your pivot table is under row labels. Right click and go ahead and click on group. And now we're going to set up our own buckets. Now it's defaults at some buckets for us that we can set up for grouping, but we're going to change those. We're going to say start at one, even though there is no one, we're just going to stay consistent. And then we're going to end at 180. And then we're going to group by 30. So starting at one, ending at 180, and group by 30, because you remember those agings always go by 30 days. Okay. So we're just going to set up those 30-day increments here. Once you've done that, click OK. And now we have a true accounts receivable aging. I say true, but uh, we want to actually have amounts here because we want to make an estimate. But this does give us the ability to kind of look at more detailed information. So going back to our instructions, we created our uh, analysis receivable in the six to 30 day buckets, but it also wants to say detailed receivable from the 61 to 90 day buckets. So in my table, I've got the uh, buckets created. If I wanted to look at these 47 transactions, I would say how many transactions and what are the details of these? All I have to do is just double click on this and it'll open up a new tab that will give me the details of all of those transactions that are in that bucket. Now, again, this is really basic. All we're asking, answering in this question is what happened? But it does give us some insight as to what's going on in the organization, particularly with receivables. 
And I would say this is very valuable because one of the things that you will you've learned in your uh, accounting and business classes is an organization cannot stay in business if it's not generating cash flow. Because we're on a accrual based accounting system, collecting these receivables is really important. So making sure that we've got track of that and we know exactly how long the items have been outstanding. The longer something's been outstanding, the more problematic something gets. So we want to have these numbers be small. Actually, we want all these numbers to be small, but the ones up here should be uh, more voluminous than the ones down here. Seeing 42 items that are 121 to 150 days, that's really disturbing to me. That would be one as an accountant, I'd say, what the heck's going on with their collection process? Are we just not collecting cash anymore? And then they'd say, boy, that guy's kind of a jerk. All right. Yeah, but sometimes you got to be a jerk if you want to get things done, all right? Not in this class, I'm not always be a nice guy, but uh, yeah, in the real world, in the real world. Okay, so let's, uh, that was our example for uh, descri descriptive analysis. Now we're going to be doing some diagnostic analysis, all right? So let's go ahead I scroll down through all of this. I kind of skipped a uh, discussion of each of these steps. So for our diagnostic analysis, we're going to be doing segregation of duties. Now, remember, segregation of duties separates out custody of assets, authorization of transactions, and recording of transactions. And for this one, we're specifically going to be talking about journal entries. And we're going to be looking at who are the individuals responsible for recording the journal entries, for creating the transactions, and the people who are responsible for authorizing the journal entries. And those should not be the same people. If they are, we've got a problem, okay? We've got a problem. Nobody should have the responsibility of both recording and authorizing journal entry transactions. Now, we probably could figure this out just by scrolling through the data, but we want to be able to look at this in a way that if we had a large data set, we could summarize this real easily. And of course, we're gonna be doing some of, the same, some of the same analysis we did before. So let's go ahead and go through our AMPS model, all right? So we're gonna perform a test of separation of duties, uh, segregation of duties by comparing who entered and who approved journal entries. So recording and authorization steps to see if all transactions maintained adequate segregation of duties. He calls it separation, uh, it's segregation. It's, come on now, got to be consistent. So I did entry and approval of various transactions violate segregation of duties. Did we have any violations? So we've got 52 journal entries that we're going to be looking at. Now, I will tell you right now, journal entries will never look quite this clean as they work in the real world. You can see we got the debits and the credits, and we got journal entry 0, 1. I wish that I could say the journal entries, because all of these transactions have exactly two lines, which, first of all, we know journal entries don't necessarily follow that pattern. But uh, secondly, the journal entry numbers are easy to follow. That being said, this is not a particularly, uh, it's, even though it's not particularly realistic, it, it gives us the information that we need for our analysis. So we got our data dictionary. All of these are fairly self-explanatory. What we're going to be focusing on is who entered and approved, which like I said, entered is going to be our recording function. Approval is our authorization function. So let's go ahead and let's just do another pivot table. All right, we're going to do another pivot table. And we're just going to go back to our old standby. We're going to click insert. Pivot table. It's going to select all of our data for us. So once we select that table range, just click on new worksheet. All right. So I'm going to check this before we move on. So I was watching my video from last semester when I did this, and I can transpose the columns and the rows, and everybody got confused because I said one thing and did another thing. So in the instructions, it says columns approved, rows entered. Hold me true to this. Make sure I actually put them right, because I put columns, uh, the columns I put entered instead of approved. So I want the columns to be approved and the rows to be entered. Now, does it make a big difference? Absolutely not, okay? But uh, everybody heard me talking, and I was just like saying, put columns approved, and I put column entered. Like, do as I say, not as I do. All right, and then our sum of values is going to be debit. <clears throat> now, I do want to talk really quickly about this, because if we were operating in the real world, we probably would not select one side of the transaction. We probably would create an aggregate transaction for the amount. So whatever the sum of the debit and credit would be, or uh, whatever the sum of one side would be. The reason we're able to do this is because all of these journal entries have exactly two, two lines, and the credit equals the debit. Again, it's not that simple in the real world, but we're going to use it for simplistic purposes here. Let's do the same thing we did last time. Let's go ahead and change our uh, values field to account. So the value field setting, change that to account. And we're going to go ahead and change the name of column labels. We're going to say we're going to change this to approved. I change row labels to entered. All right. 
So now in our columns, we've got all the individuals who approve transactions, which it looks like we have three in sets of initials. And then we've got two sets of initials for those who enter transactions. Does anybody see an issue in this table right here? So it looks like that we've got an individual with the same initials. And we assume that's the same initials because there's a limited number of individuals. It could be two people with initials VR, okay? Which I think it's a possibility, but probably not likely given this seems to be, to be a small organization. And it looks like that individual not only has the ability to both enter and approve transactions, but entered and approved their own transaction, okay? So entered their transaction and approved their own transaction. Now, what does that equate to? Well, it's a little bit like you all taking your exams and then grading your own exams. Might there a little, be a little bit of conflict of interest in that particular scenario? It says, oh yes, uh, this question, I got it wrong, but I knew what the answer was. So I'm gonna give myself full credit on that. Yeah, it's, it's a wonderful life that you live there, but uh, unfortunately kind of creates an issue. It would create great grade point averages, you know, with Truman State would be really, really renowned. Might impede the learning process though, might impede that learning process. So this is something we'd be very concerned about. Now, the reason that I say this is not a true diagnostic analysis is this still only answers what happened, okay? This is only a descriptive analysis so far. It said somebody approved and or entered and approved their own uh, entry, their own transaction. Would we let it rest here? Would you say, hey, it looks like somebody's got uh, the ability to enter or approve and enter their own transaction. All right, well, we found it. Let's go get lunch. No, okay. Keep, keep in mind that we're always trying to ask what is the next step, okay? Just like the variance analysis back in 221, you would say, I found an issue. Now I need to investigate that issue to answer the question, why did this happen? So this identifies that something's going on here. We've got a transaction here. If I can hit, up, hit it where somebody entered and approved their own transaction, I would print out this transaction, then I would go bring this to the uh, whoever was in charge, the CFO, the controller, whoever it is, say, can you discuss what the responsibilities of this individual and why they were able to authorize, enter and authorize their own transaction, report and authorize their own transaction? CFO would probably be saying, I don't know, that's not something that should happen in our system. I said, well, I guess you weren't using NetSuite, or either that or somebody got the uh, administrator position in NetSuite. Who knows what the situation might be, but this is not something that should take place. So segregation of duties has got a problem. We need to discuss why that happened and stop it from happening in the future. All right. So these are simple questions, pretty simple approaches, not particularly difficult to answer. The goal here again is not to go through and try to identify complex analysis tools. We will be doing a little bit more articulation uh, next week. We're going to be using some more advanced tools and some more advanced equations. But even then, the goal is not to be able to do step complex stuff in Excel and show off your prowess. The goal is to be able to say, can you answer the question? And if so, how do we do that? And so these are easy, simple ways to answer those pretty basic questions. Once we get into the more advanced stuff next week, we're going to implement a few more new tools. Even then, it's still going to be pretty basic and straightforward. All right. With that, it's time to do homework. Or I shouldn't say time to check homework. Hopefully, you've already done the homework. All right, big data is often described by four Vs. What are those four Vs? Well, we've got volume, velocity, veracity, and variety, which are V. But if you remember from the lecture, I said that there were five Vs, okay? There were five Vs. So uh, what, is what is missing from this list? Value, remember we also have a high value. So let's just go ahead and make sure we assign. So in addition to noting the five Vs, not the four Vs, the five Vs, you need to know what their relative size is, okay? So when we talk about volume, what, 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 what is that? Is that uh, large or small? That's huge, yeah, huge volume, okay? What about velocity? High velocity. What about veracity? Velocity, veracity is low, okay? Remember, veracity is that accuracy thing, and we notice that accuracy in, in data can be very low. Variety, high, and then volume, also high, okay? So. Good to know. We'll come back to that in discussion in a little bit. Uh, question number two, according to estimates considered in the chapter, after what percentage of a data analysis time is spent cleaning or scrubbing the data to be ready for analysis? So let's talk about the high end. So assuming that you go on and do some data analysis in the real world, how much of that time that you spent in data analysis would be uh, in the ETL, the extract transform reward process? Up to how a percent? 90%, okay? That's a lot of time, okay? 
10% of your time spent on the good stuff, I guess you can consider like the analysis itself the dessert on the meal, but you got to eat your veggies to get to that point. That, that veggies may comprise 90% of your meal. Should be a vegetarian, that's actually pretty good. Yeah. But uh, yeah, so 50 to 90% is what we talked about, so up to 90%. In the acronym ETL, I just actually used those three terms already. What does ETL stand for? Extract, transform, and load. Okay, extract, transform, and load, which is kind of a memorization task, but it's still good to remember that. All right. Question number four, which term is used to describe the science of examining raw data, removing excess noise from the data set, and organizing the data with the purpose of drawing conclusion for uh, decision making? So examining raw data, removing excess noise, that sure sounds like a lot of that process we talked about with ETL, extract, transform, and load, okay? And then drawing conclusions for the decision making, that's the analysis step. So what was that general term that we talked about? What was the kind of the theme of the chapter? We talk about big data, but is this actually big data? Big data is the, what we're going to be analyzing, okay? So we're probably talking about an analysis process, which sounds, sure sounds like data analytics to me. Yep, data analytics, okay. All right, ADS, okay, ADS, which, believe it or not, Accounting Doctoral Scholars is true. That's an acronym for ADS. I was an Accounting Doctoral Scholar. It's a scholarship for PhD studies. That was also ADS, which is not what we're talking about. It's not what we're talking about here. The standard format, I thought it was funny to do that in there. Uh, standard format for data field, uh, files and fields to typically need to support an external audit given financial process areas that were developed by ACPA. Acronym ADS stands for what three words? Well, if we're talking about PhD research, it's accounting doctoral scholars, but we're not. We're talking about making sure we have consistent data formats so that people who are trying to analyze this data can know what the format should be in advance. Remember that example we talked about in class where I showed you an example of an Excel, and I said, has anybody tried to import a PDF into Excel? It's a nightmare. So if a client gives you a PDF, you're going to say, no, please put this in a readable format that we can import, import this in, All right? What do we call that? What was that an example of? Give me a hint. The word audit is really, really important here. Audit data standards. Audit data standards. That's what we're looking at there. Question number six. What type of question does a prescriptive analysis address? By the way, there is a 100% chance that I will ask you at least one question like this on the exam. In all likelihood, I will ask you multiple questions like this on the exam. This is one of those areas that I think is really important that you will encounter at multiple times throughout your career about the different types of analysis. So you do need to understand the four types of analysis, okay? So we talked about prescriptive analysis. Prescriptive analysis, that's the far complex end, the very far top, okay? Remember, prescriptive analysis is forward-looking. It says, based on what has happened, what do we do? What do we do based on what we think will happen? So it's saying we have to know what will happen, and then we have to uh, propose a solution for that. So what should we do based on what we expect will happen? B. Uh, going down, we have the least, uh, the least difficult, the least challenging and complex. What type of question does descriptive an analysis address? So this is just looking at data and saying, what does the data tell us? What is a better way to uh, address that particular question? What happened? That's it. What happened? Which seems too simple. You want to look for the complex answer. That's all we're looking at here. Okay. What type of analysis addresses the question of why did it happen? So we know what happened, but now we need to investigate why did what happened actually happen? All right, that was our second type of analysis we just performed. That was our diagnostic analysis, diagnostic analysis. What type of analysis address the question whether a customer will ultimately pay if credit is granted? This is kind of an interesting one, okay? So what we're trying to determine is what's going to happen in the future, okay? We grant, if we grant a credit to a customer, Will they pay us back? What type of question answers the question, or what type of analysis answers the question, what will happen in the future? Like we're trying to predict what's going to happen. Predictive analysis, predictive analysis. All right. And then finally, if we want to know what grade we need on the final of the class based on the expected performance before the final, we call that a what. So this is something that you can actually do. Once we've got all the grades in this course, you can look at your grade, and I've got given you a spreadsheet that has all the numbers in the class and you can plug in numbers and you can say, all right, based on everything I've received in the grades in this course, on the final exam, I need to have this grade to get an A in the class or this grade to get a B in the class, okay? So you're saying, based on everything that's happened, what do I need to do? What does that sound like? Give me a hit, starts with a P. <coughs> 
Prescriptive, yes. Predictive or prescriptive? So one of the two. Prescriptive, because we get, again, we're saying we know what's hap or we know what's going to happen. What do we need to do? Okay, what does our response need to be? What's our solution? So we're plugging in that final number saying, here's what I need on that exam in order to achieve my grade. All right, moving on to the problems. All right, data analysts can be disaggregated into four steps of the AMPS model, a part of the AMPS. Which of these AMPS processes would be considered mastering the data? Uh, so, uh, yeah, and uh, yeah, so I think, or performing the analysis. So we've actually got only two, mastering or performing. So let's go ahead and make sure we remember what the AMPS model is. So A in the AMPS model stands for ask the question, okay? Pretty basic. If we have any data, we need to understand what it is we're going to do with that data. So the very first thing we have to identify is what type of questions are we going to ask with this data? What type of questions are we trying to answer? So ask the question. Now, fortunately, that's not an, a, a relevant to this particular question. We only have two, but let's move on to the other ones, okay? So M is mastering the data. What does mastering the data mean? Well, a lot of mastering the data relates to the extract, transform, and load process. Cleaning the data, validating the data, preparing it for analysis. So before we perform any analysis, we've got to make sure the data has set up so we can perform that analysis. Then we perform the analysis, okay? That's when we start asking those questions. We start uh, running the queries to actually ask the data what it's telling us. So performing the analysis. And then we have S, S to share the story. We haven't gotten there yet. But that is where we take the information that we've gained from our analysis and we share it with other individuals. And we're going to talk about different ways to do that in Chapter 11. All right. So we've got either M for master the data or yeah, master the data or P for pouring the analysis. Removing extraneous data and noise. Is it M or P? M. This is mastering the data. Yes. Looking for trends in the data that might predict new sales opportunities. What do you guys think? Performing the analysis, that's P. Okay, that's performing the analysis, yes. Finding the necessary data from the financial reporting system to give to the external auditor for analysis. It's kind of interesting, okay? So the key here is saying finding the necessary data. So this is, no, this is before we ever perform any analysis. Before we perform any analysis, we've got to know what data do we need in order to be able to an, analyze? What do we have to do? So this is after we've asked the question, we've got to say, where can we get this data? Sure sounds like mastering data, M, okay? D, performing tests of internal controls by the external auditor. That word perform is pretty a pretty big clue. Perform obviously means mastering the data. I'm joking, okay? Performing the analysis, performing the analysis, okay? Considering Champaign, Illinois' weather patterns to, uh, to predict corn production in the immediate area. That sure is like a performing analysis right there because we're actually trying to look at data and say, what does this data tell us? All right, so it's going to be key perform the analysis. Consolidating large volumes of data from multiple sources and platforms. So you've got 15 different spreadsheets that you all have to merge to those together in order to be able to have one aggregate data set. Hopefully you're not doing it in Excel. Hopefully you're using a more advanced tool, which you'll continue to learn as you move on through your career here at Truman. But uh, what does that sound like? Are we doing any analysis in that step? No, we are aggregating the data, which means that we are mastering the data. We are mastering the data. All right, question number two, match the definition of the keywords to the terms. So we've got quite a bit going on here. Uh, so, oops, I'm, in, I'm on three, sorry. Number two, right here. Match the, de match the definitions with the four Bs to describe big data, which, uh, again, it's still five Bs, but they only give us four in this particular one. So volume, velocity, variety, veracity, which one is which? So unstructured and unprocessed data such as comments and social media emails and global assisting system system measurements this could actually be a couple different things but what is the probably the biggest one we're talking about here this is not commenting on the accuracy of the data even though i would say certain types of this data could be inaccurate uh what is this more like variety this is variety yes the massive amount of streaming data evolved evolved amount probably implies volume yes Data coming at fast speeds and, or in real time, such as streaming videos or news feeds. Sure sounds like velocity to me. Velocity, yep. Opinions or facts. Some people would say opinions are facts, especially if they're my opinions. Yeah, yeah. But that's not true. So opinions tend to vary, okay? But opinions tend to, uh, we talk about opinions, so we talk about a variety, you know, that, that, that's a possibility. But more accurately, People have differing opinions, and a lot of people's opinions do not necessarily align with facts. 
which means that we've got a veracity issue, an accuracy issue. This is more alignment with veracity, okay? Data with a lot of missing observations. All right. That also probably has an accuracy problem because we have missing observations, it's hard to analyze the data, which creates a veracity problem. So this is also veracity. Stock market data that updates every five seconds. Five seconds is very quick. What's another word for quick? Velocity, yes. Financial statement data that appears in tables. Got a lot of different, got a lot of different types of data that you could have that appears in a table. That'd be an example of variety. And then all Twitter data from 2021. Twitter's kind of just one of the small websites that doesn't publish information very often, does it? No, no, I'm being facetious. Obviously, Twitter has a lot of detail, so we're talking about volume, a lot of data there to be analyzed, a lot of data there to be analyzed. Probably a lot of variety of data too, you know, depending on what your what your perspective is and what what is what Twitter pages you frequent. I am so old school. I've never actually opened a Twitter account. I don't even know what whole like. Uh, Dr. Caden tells me about this thing called Yik Yak. I didn't even know this existed until I continued a couple of years ago, but uh, apparently Yik Yak's like the social media page of preference for treatment students. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to assign my GTRA to actually get a Yik Yak account to keep me up to date on uh, things like that. Maybe that's a plan moving forward. Yeah, uh, yeah, a lot of gossip apparently on Yik Yak. Who knew, who knew? All right. Match the definition of keywords to their terms. So we're actually gonna be defining according to some standards and the definitions that we've looked at before. So a standard name and data format for files and fields to build a new support external audit. Well, there's that word audit again. So does that sound like audit data standards? Sure sounds like audit data standards. And I'm going to say that's correct. Okay. Data sets are too large and too complex for businesses existing systems to handle using traditional capabilities to capture, store, manage, and analyze these data sets. <laughs> so data sets are big. Can we agree to that statement? Many data sets are big. That's a characteristic of big data, big data. By the way, I don't I don't think it needs to follow this line. It just happens to be that there was an alignment between these first two. Anyway, process of cleaning and scrubbing the data for analysis can take place. Okay, that's ETL. What's another term for ETL? Master the data. Yes. Okay. Master the data. It's process of determining how separation of duties was violated to the company. It sounds like something we've done. Okay. What was the answer to that question? What what type of analysis were we performing? That was our. Diagnostic analysis, very good. We're, we're determining why this happened, why this happened. Process of summary, summarizing accounts to you about how long it's been outstanding. We also did that, that was our first one. That was a descriptive analysis, descriptive analysis. And delivering the findings to the decision maker uh, which firms our company should approve for credits. So we probably only have one left, okay. It's gonna be share the story, okay, sharing the story. So basically, we've performed our analysis and we said, hey, you've got to make a decision about whether or not we should make proof credit for this. Here's all the information that we gleaned from this, presenting in a way that's easily digestible for you. That's a nice way to actually set off this particular chapter because in the next chapter, we're going to say, how do we share the story? It's going to be interesting because we've got some tools at our disposal that'll make that uh, process much easier. But with that, we are done a little bit early for today. Have a wonderful weekend. I'll see you all on Monday. <laughs>